Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. Most recently joining the ranks of high-profile production facility ransomware attacks at Nissan, Colonial Pipeline, JBS Foods, Schneider Electric, and even Foxconn is Dole Foods. The global food processor was the victim of a ransomware attack in early February that led to shutting down production systems throughout North America and halted shipments to numerous retailers and distributors. As if this wasn't enough to help illustrate the continuing rise in ransomware attacks on the manufacturing sector, Dragos recently reported that such attacks surged 87% in 2022, with 83% of those attacks leading to diminished ICS performance and 50% leading to a loss of visibility and control of operational systems. Dragos attributes limited visibility of OT assets and an overabundance of shared access as leading vulnerabilities. And although the culprit for the Dole hack has not yet been identified, Dragos reports the ransomware as a service organizations like Lockbit, Black Basta, and Hive continue to aggressively target the industrial sector. Our guest for today's episode has a special familiarity with these groups and perspective on how to respond to them. Before we talk to our guest for this episode, we're excited to announce that Security Breach is being sponsored by Rockwell Automation. For more information on their cybersecurity solutions, you can go to rockwellautomation.com. At this time, it's my pleasure to welcome Travis Wong to Security Breach. He serves as the VP of Risk Engineering and Client Services at Resilience Insurance, a leading provider of cyber risk management solutions. Travis, thanks so much for joining us today. There's been a number of high-profile ransomware attacks in the industrial sector. The latest one was Dole Foods. We don't have a ton of information that's made public, but in what you do, I know you've been following this hack particularly closely. What can you share with us in terms of your interpretation of the situation and maybe how Dole responded to it? Thanks again for the question. Uh, the Dole hack is another example of how threat actors are trying to compromise our manufacturing um, industry. Uh, they're trying to get as much money as possible, and the manufacturing industry is ripe for uh, the picking, frankly, with the OT environments. Um, a lot of these OT environments uh, have outdated technology, uh, not updated very frequently, uh, and they're, they're again, ripe for the picking. Uh, the Dole situation, uh, like as you mentioned, uh, there hasn't been much information out there as to how uh, the incident took place, um, or frankly, follow up since the announcement was made. Uh, through the, the PR release, as well as some of the memos that were sent out, out uh, to Dole clients. Um, so what we do know is it affected their North American manufacturing operations. Uh, Dole had some kind of incident response and crisis management program in place. Uh, they enacted that program and that policy um, and have been investigating and responding to uh, incidents at this time. Uh, I thought it was fantastic that they mentioned um, that they're specifically working with law enforcement to remediate the, the situation, to do their investigations. Um, it's something that not all companies are doing in this day and age, um, but I, I can I can tell you firsthand from conversations with uh, some of the, the feds, uh, for lack of a better term, um, that they're highly encouraging uh, cooperation because at the end of the day, they're not looking to uh, penalize uh, any of the, the companies out there. They're just looking to remediate and provide assistance uh, to the to companies that might be affected by some of these ransomware incidents. Yeah. You know, like you said, and like we would both said, basically, there hasn't been a ton made public, but reading between the lines, you can sort of infer some of the things that may have occurred. And I want to make that clear. I am speculating a little bit on my end. None of this has been made public. One of the things that was came out in a recent conference call when they're looking at quarterly earnings, a question was posed to Dole in terms of, are they going to be able to recoup whatever the costs were associated were, were with this hack? You feel like we know it's a ransomware attack. Due to how quickly things came back online, you f the, the feeling is that they paid a ransom. In these situations, regardless of Dole or whoever it is, do you what do you feel is the right approach to take? Do you have to pony up and sort of pay the attackers, or do you try to hold out and do things differently? It really depends on what you have at your disposal uh, to recover from the incident. Um, you have to find out if data has been encrypted, um, you have to know if data has been exfiltrated. Um, if so, um, can you actually resume operations with minimal impact or, or long-term ramifications? Um, if you find out that the incident is fairly self-contained, uh, you have backups in which uh, have been validated and you're able to, to get back up and running as quickly as possible, perhaps a ransom payment isn't necessary. Um, at the end of the day, you want to ensure that your operations can continue as uh, you know pretty much unimpeded um, and pre-incident, same as post-incident. 
Um, if you can ensure and you have processes that you validated and you're confident in your ability to continue operations, again, uh, perhaps ransom is, is not needed uh, in terms of the being paid. Uh, the official government stance is that ransoms should never be paid. Uh, as a private industry representative and as a representative of the insurance and risk management industry, um, I would say it, it is definitely a case by case basis. Um, if you find that you can't recover um, because you haven't validated your processes, because there are other external factors uh, at play, um, perhaps the ransom is uh, the best mode uh, to to move forward and to, again, continue those operations. Um, unfortunately, can't bro uh, paint the, the picture with broad strokes. Um, yeah. It has to be definitely a case by case, situation by situation evaluation. Yeah. You know, we see a lot of different data that's put out and, and revolving, especially around ransomware, in terms of if you pay the ransom, how frequently are you getting the data back or operations restored? And it's really all over the board. In your experience, do you see these hackers basically following through on what they say in terms of pay us and we'll either give you the data, or restore operations, or are they not always being as honest as we would hope they would be? What's your experience in that? I mean, they're as honest as criminals can be, uh, right? <laughs> With it, yeah. that said, uh, they are running a business. So it is quite fascinating. If, if you're unfamiliar with how these reactor groups operate, they may have dedicated customer service departments because um, the people people are being uh, exploited for one of two reasons, primarily. It's hacktivism of some sort, some kind of motivation independent of money. Um, and secondarily, again, to get that money. I, I would say the vast majority of these incidents are a result of a monetary gain. Um, so in, in that case, um, it, it's important to just understand the, the underlying principles and the, the foundation in which uh, these, these threat actors are trying to do uh, you know, th these activities. Um, if they renege on their promises to restore operations, to provide that decryption key, um, and they find out that, hey, if, even if you pay the ransom, you're not going to get restored then that reduces the credibility of the threat actor group. The likelihood they'll get paid again in the future is diminished, um, and therefore they lose their credibility. So if they're financially motivated, they want to do everything they can to essentially uh, get payment as quickly as possible, move on to their next target, and continue that churn. Um, they're not looking to focus on one incident solely for the, focus, you know, for the intent of, of doing so. They're looking to get in, get paid, get out. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things I'd be interested to get your take on it is we've seen samples of some of these notes that occur when people try to go into the system and basically the ransomware note pops up. One of the things that caught my attention in one of these was them basically encouraging the company that was hacked not to reach out to a negotiator with their insurance company because that can delay the whole situation and they don't want to get other people involved. I'd love to hear your take uh, on that situation. If you had somebody who got that type of stipulation in their note, what do you do with that? Would you really trust someone who's telling you not to get <laughs> professional help? Yeah, uh, these point. professionals are out there and they exist for a reason. Um, it's one of those industries that is, is difficult to understand because you are that industry in particular is their whole the whole reason they exist is to negotiate with criminals. Um, it, it's unfortunate that it exists, but if a criminal is telling you, "Hey, we did something. We're compromised your systems. Don't get the best help that m may be out there." Uh, yeah. I just would not trust uh, that advice. Um, I understand the motivation behind it. Um, it could delay the process. It could create uh, uncertainty. Uh, and that's what the threat actor groups may be trying to uh, reduce. Uh, again, they're trying to get paid as quickly as possible. Uh, my advice is, is always to look to your experts. People are experts and, and companies are experts for a reason. Um, leverage the expertise they have. Yeah. You know, one of the other points you brought up, and, and that's an excellent take. I appreciate that. One of the things that came up in the conversation with Dole is, as you alluded to, they're working with a third party provider and they got involved with law enforcement very quickly. Two great steps, in my opinion, in terms of their response approach. What all that really kind of leads to is a little bit more sharing of information across the board and provides a little bit more clarity in terms of what's going on and dealing with a lot of these threat actors. What is your take there in terms of how do we get to a point where we can have more visibility into these attacks so that we can learn more about what's going on? Dole's in a tough spot. They're a publicly traded company. They don't want to use, you know, face some of those reputational issues. But at, some, at the same time, they also have a responsibility to the industry to offer some visibility into what was going on. So I'd be interested to hear your take. 
Yeah, I think it's essential for us to share knowledge. Without knowledge sharing, we can't learn from our mistakes. And frankly, human history, uh, this, this is how we learn. Uh, you make a mistake, you learn from it by correcting actions, and then you can move on and you can evolve your processes. Um, I think one of the things we suffer from uh, across all of industry, public and private, is the stigmatization of being hacked or suffering a cyber incident. Um, the more shame that's brought on as a result of these incidents, the less knowledge sharing people are willing to partake in. Um, and if we keep everything behind closed doors, we'll never be able to learn from each other's mistakes, won't be able to improve. Um, and these cyber incidents uh, and attacks, you know, you can have the same low level attack propagated multiple times if there's no knowledge sharing, if there's no learning. Um, so my opinion, personal opinion is for the sake of advancement of the cybersecurity uh, initiative, the industry uh, for for risk management purposes is it's essential that we we share knowledge uh, with one another, best practices, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, that's why I do really uh, appreciate some of the knowledge sharing that the government funded agencies have uh, facilitated. Uh, you have your ISOs and your ISACs, for instance, um, that bring together common industries or common groups of organizations to facilitate some of that knowledge sharing. Okay. Excellent. You know, giving back to this attack a little bit, to me, it felt like this may have been a bit more targeted. Um, we do hear a lot about these groups really just sending out a lot of probes with all this new operational technology that's being introduced to the plant floor, finding a soft spot and just sort of going for it as a target of opportunity. In your experience in working in the industrial sector, is there a way that hackers are going right now? Are they doing more targeted or are they just basically taking advantage of whatever's presented to them? I would say the easiest way to get in is what they're going to do. So target of opportunity, especially when they're motivated uh, by financial gain, um, would be the the overwhelming, uh, I guess, mode or, or uh, rationale for, for trying to pursue uh, infiltration. Uh, from my perspective, there are always hacktivists out there. There are state-sponsored attackers out there too. Um, so I do not want to discount or ignore that they exist um, altogether. Uh, but for those financially motivated threat actor groups, uh, the easiest way in the, is probably the best way in for them. Um, they're not looking for necessarily a challenge. They're looking, again, to get paid yeah. and get out of there. Yeah. You know, leading into that, we've heard a lot, especially in the ransomware, an in industrial ransomware, we hear about some of the, the bigger entities out there, these ransomware as a service organizations, Lockbit, Black Basta, um, some other ones. Our Evil is a big one. That's more of a nation state type of situation. Are there any other groups that you've seen really popping up on your radar or, or different tactics that they're using that maybe we should be aware of? Yeah, from a tactics perspective, I think it's really important to focus on uh, IoT devices, especially as we, we migrate forward. Um, operational technology is be becoming internet connected, network connected. It's no longer a self-contained operating system for, for your typical CNC. Um, now it's all connected in order to optimize efficiency, data sharing. Um, so as more and more of these devices become connected, uh, as more and more of them are incorporated with uh, Internet of Things or IoT uh, type links and, and devices, I think this just presents more opportunity uh, for deficiencies, for gaps, for threat actors to compromise um, technology um, as everything, again, becomes more interconnected. Um, so especially for the industrial sector, it's anytime you're implementing some new technology, additional connectivity, it's important to do a risk assessment to really understand uh, what uh, risks are presented by introducing this new technology. Yes, there can be operational gains, operational efficiency gains, um, but you may be introducing new risks to your, to your operations. Yeah, I mean, we see that the, uh, manufacturing has really embraced digital transformation strategies, especially during the pandemic and now afterwards with all the lessons learned that came about in terms of being able to be more automated, working remote, all of that. Are you seeing cybersecurity being part of those digital transformation plans more frequently now, or is that still kind of a, a lapse? That's a great question. Um, I would say in particular over the past four years, uh, as more and more of these digital transformation efforts are, are underway and there is push for this uh, digital transformation, cyber security in particular has been integrated into that digital transformation process. Uh, there are still a lot of organizations, a lot of uh, subsectors of the manufacturing industry that haven't caught on yet to the cybersecurity initiatives and, and the need to secure uh, while transforming digitally. Um, but I would say there is increased focus, there is increased overall awareness 
of uh, cybersecurity incidents, um, base, basic needs, um, as well as the risks that are presented by increased connectivity and that digital transformation. Yeah. All right, Travis, we've talked about the bad guys a lot. Let's talk about the good guys a little bit. What can you tell us about resilience insurance and some of the things you guys are doing to support some of these cybersecurity initiatives in the industrial sector? I love that you called resilience <laughs> insurance one of the good guys. You know, that's right, right here in my heart. Um, but we're really trying to promote cyber resilience. So helping our clients and uh, take a look at their, their cyber risk management processes um, and take a look at it holistically. Um, so quite commonly, cybersecurity or infosec was seen as a uh, subsect of the, the IT industry. Um, but we think if you're if you're traveling along the cyber resilience journey, um, you should be taking you should look and analyze your cyber risk, your operational risk, uh, your continuity risk. Um, so taking ba basically breaking down um, the, the finance barriers, the IT security barriers, um, and your risk management function and trying to link all of those together um, so that there's a holistic journey, a common language um, that all of these uh, operational silos um, can can integrate with um, and, and ensure that, you know, no matter where you are on your journey to cyber resilience, there's a starting point. Unfortunately, there may never be an ending point. Um, it, it's a continuous uh, iterative journey. Um, you're always trying to improve, um, creating guidelines and, and overarching uh, frameworks to improve. Uh, but largely what, what resilience insurance does is, uh, again, provide that risk transfer portion via the insurance. Uh, we'll provide risk insights and risk uh, acceptance via our technology solutions. Um, and we'll also assist with risk mitigation uh, through some of the, the products and services that we offer um, as well. Um, so we are definitely trying to take a look at risk holistically rather than just be a traditional insurance company that's only focused on financial risk transfer. Makes sense. You know, in looking, getting back a little bit to the Dole Foods hack, and when you look at how there's, <clears throat> there's some similarities in terms of that hack, as well as Colonial Pipeline, uh, JBS, I think one of the reasons that industrials become so appealing is much like healthcare, much like financial institutions, there's a downstream and upstream impact. It's not just that institution that feels the pain of the hit. So as that continues to be the case, what can especially manufacturers do now who already have enough supply chain volatility to deal with the way it is? What are some of the things they might be able to integrate into their response plans or into their cybersecurity plans to help out their partners sort of up and downstream? I think risk assessment is a really important part of, of uh, the go forward actions, um, not only for yourself, but for your supply chain partners, uh, especially with just in time uh, operations these days. Any disruption to the supply chain has a magnified effect both up and downstream. Um, so the more that you can identify your own risks, the more you can identify your upstream and downstream risks as they relate to you. And then again, outward to your partners, um, as a, an entire supply chain, um, you can take a holistic view uh, and assessment of your total risk. And you can find perhaps the, the weaker points that need to be bolstered, um, or at least if there are identified areas uh, for improvement, um, you, you're aware of them and you can create mitigation plans for them. Um, so I think especially the the way that we operate and the way the supply chains function in today's day and age, it's not enough to just look at your own risk, but you need to look at your upstream and downstream uh, supplier and, and vendor risk as well. Yeah. So a couple of just kind of general topics here, Travis, you know, you mentioned hacktivists and sort of the growth there. And initially it feels like a lot of those groups were going after nation states. And a lot of it was actually... We kind of looked the other way because these were nation states doing bad things, so we weren't as concerned about it. But in a lot, in some cases, we've seen these groups now expand and get into industrial control systems that are affecting things like wastewater and other uh, electric, electrical utilities and things like that. So they're having a huge negative impact on a lot of people that have nothing to do with that nation state. Are there other international type of incidents or, or growth or activities that you're seeing that could come home to roost here in the not too distant future? Yeah, it, I think something to focus on is still the, the tensions and the, and the war, uh, frankly, between uh, Russia, Ukraine. Uh, a lot of threat actor groups have been, although they are globally uh, dispersed, uh, have been focused in, in the Eastern European region. Um, I think it's, as that war continues and to matures and um, ends uh, one of these days, it'll be important to, to know and track uh, the, the changes to threat actor behavior, um, perhaps for a while, a lot of their attention was specifically on that conflict. Yeah. 
Um, as the conflict winds down, their focus could be uh, therefore turned outward uh, to what they were doing before um, and then increase activity, uh, frankly, uh, in the short to, to medium term. Uh, if you look back at 2022 um, and the beginning of uh, early, early uh, January 2023, uh, the number of uh, ransomware incidents was down substantially compared to the previous year. Um, perhaps the, the tensions in, in Eastern Europe uh, could be a contributing factor to that. Um, so again, as those wind down, uh, perhaps that activity again ramps up. Absolutely. Another hot topic when it comes to cybersecurity, especially in the industrial sector, is finding the right people with the right expertise to implement a lot of these security measures. It's a real challenge because most of the folks have a background in IT, and it's not always a clear interpretation on the OT side of things. What advice could you offer in terms of trying to identify these individuals for OT security roles? Or is there a for lack of a better term, sort of a, a secret sauce or a list of ingredients we should be looking for to find the individuals for these roles? It's a, an absolutely great question, uh, Jeff. The OT environment is drastically different from IT. I, I would say if you're looking to um, go down that path of securing your OT environments, uh, first look perhaps to uh, an MSP or an MSSP that specializes um, in the OT environments and protecting those. Um, that can give you good insight into the type of experience needed. Um, and frankly, looking at, at the resumes and, and the other um, contacts or contracts they may have can give you insight into how well um, they're informed and their ability to protect your uh, OT environment. If you're looking for specific individuals uh, for the OT environment, um, the great thing these days is there are uh, training certifications. Um, there are uh, courses and, and education specific to uh, OT security. Um, that's becoming more and more popular, more and more prominent um, as the rise of OT compromise uh, you know, has occurred. Um, so there are resources out there today and th those are growing. Um, so I, I would say definitely look to third party help um, if you need it immediately. But if you're trying to be homegrown, trying to build your own um, uh, capabilities, um, look to, to those who might be leveraging uh, an OT related uh, technical certification, or at least have a background uh, and work history related to protecting OT environments. No, it makes sense. We're seeing way too many operational engineers sort of being forced to take on this role, and it's not their fault. They're, the skill set just doesn't always match up. So good, uh, good insight there. Um, wrapping things up here, Travis, last question we always ask folks on the show, looking down the road, 12 to 18 months, any particular trends that you're seeing or identifying or, or we should be aware of? Ah, there's so many. So what's old is new. Um, the, the way that that uh, threat actors are getting in is, is still the same uh, as, as it was in the past. It's quite commonly the human element is still the weakest element out there. Um, so in that respect, I, I would want to emphasize that it's important to ensure your employees are aware of what is uh, normal and what is abnormal via their security training and awareness programs. Um, it's important that you exercise uh, phishing uh, simulations with your employees so that um, they see something that looks off, um, they know to report it, um, and, and really control that human element. Um, beyond that, I, I do think some new uh, federal regulation, state regulation, international regulation will come down as a, uh, related to privacy as well as cybersecurity. Um, in 2022, for instance, the SCC uh, sent out some uh, guidance that stated they were, they were looking to create uh, board awareness uh, requirements related to cybersecurity. Um, there are organizations, uh, apologies, uh, countries in the European Union um, that are looking for cybersecurity related requirements and, and minimum uh, capabilities as well. Uh, even within the United States, uh, CISA um, and other uh, regulatory agencies uh, within the United States are looking for uh, uh, certifications as well um, and, and capabilities attestations. Um, so I think there will be a lot in the regulatory space. Um, from a privacy perspective, we're still very much uh, state focused. States have state specific privacy uh, laws and, and regulations, uh, but there is still a continuing push um, to create a federal uh, regulation. Uh, yeah. That's also kind of uh, exemplified by the recent uh, President Biden uh, created a, an announcement uh, beginning of March um, that stated this is what the, the White House's uh, cybersecurity uh, standard and approach will be. Um, cybersecurity and the focus on it is not going away anytime soon. Um, so 
the more and more it becomes more important. Um, and the more and more we have these nation state backed attackers and the more we're, uh, private industries are being disrupted, um, I think the more regulation, frankly, will come down uh, from, from local, state and federal government entities. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you bring up the the legislative efforts that are ongoing. You know, I and also just to reiterate the what's old is new, we continue to hear that as well. You know, you can't relax in some of the things you've defended against in the past because that'll come back and get you. The fishing stuff continues to be really a big deal, especially in the industrial sector. Circling back to the legislative efforts, though, you know, we saw some legislation earlier in the year that was included in some other infrastructure investment bill and that identified certain industries that had to report hacks and be more transparent about those things that were going on. Do you see that expanding into more general industry or do you think they're going to stay focused on basically it was a lot of infrastructure based entities that needed to report those attacks? So looking again, going back to Dole, are we going to get to a point, do you think, where somebody like Dole would have to be reporting all of this to Homeland Security or whoever it may be? I do think we eventually get there. Uh, to, as you mentioned, we've uh, the the government has focused a lot on defense-based industrial as well as critical infrastructure to start out. Um, I don't see that being the, I guess, the the bounds of which reporting requirements uh, are, are established. I do think um, that as this continues on and as there is more and more legislative and regulatory pressure um, to provide transparency, I think other industries uh, will be added to this list over time. Um, and perhaps it, it becomes a, a generic uh, rule across multiple industries uh, or all private industry. Um, Who's to say? There's, I have no insight into if that's a, a reality in the short term, medium term, long term. Um, but it would not surprise me if uh, broader industries or, or additional industries are added uh, in, to the defense-based industrial and critical infrastructure reporting requirements. Yeah. No, again, pure conjecture on my part, but I agree with you 100%. I think that is the way we're, way we're trending, and I think industry as a whole will be better for it. So, um, before we uh, before we part ways here, Travis, any additional thoughts? Any final thoughts you'd like to share? No, uh, I, I love that. Uh, what's old is new. I, I just want to emphasize that again. <laughs> yeah. um, unfortunately, the the journey to cyber resilience, the dur- journey to becoming secure, uh, never ends. Um, it's really an interesting uh, journey to to go down, though. So, if there are any uh, individuals or, or people uh, looking to to you know join a, a very uh, up and coming, uh, thorough and, and fascinating industry, uh, cybersecurity might be the right career for them. Um, yeah. So. Industry, please continue making cybersecurity investments. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Travis. And for more information on the work that Travis is doing, you can check out his company at www.cyberresilience.com. And thank you for joining us today. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. And if you have a cybersecurity story or topic that you'd like to have us explore on Security Breach, you can reach me at jeff at IEN.com. For Travis Wong, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.